I don't mind being seen as as a as a very British artist, I suppose, because I am British and I'm responding to all of the the things that I can see in, in British society that's not good and that I want to draw people's attention to and I want to try to in doing that improve in some way. Not in a do good way, really mm -hmm. but just yeah, or in a do-goodery way. I think, that's, I think that's kind of what Luca's about. And I think yeah. that often, I think that's what my my work has become a lot about as well. You know, talking about, like we said, talking about issues like class, economics, um, democracy, democracy, I media yeah. stereotyping. You know, and those are things which you know. The, the, there's the practical elements of how you make it as an artist, but I think that they, uh, and how you not make it, how you get by as an artist, how you sustain yourself as an artist, but they, they have to, for me, and I think, for, well, obviously for both of us, they have to be linked to those sort of wider issues. Yeah. You know, one, one's, one's inextricably, inextricably that word, uh, connected to the other, yeah. you know, and, and, and I think that's, that, that's the motivation for me, well, for me, certainly that's the motivation for making the work. And that comes from, from to a certain extent teaching um, it comes around from getting things like commissions but also balancing workshops commissions all those other things the sort of DIY nature of Looper with 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 maybe engaging with officialdom to a certain extent but maybe trying to engage with that on your own terms a little or or to skew it I don't sell work I've sold one work in the last 10 years you know that that making money from selling work doesn't come into my equations at all yeah, yeah. and that is really refreshing because yeah. you know that you're not going to make any money for yourself <laughs> <laughs> so you can think about other ways of making money yeah. um, and I've been very lucky last year that I had quite a lot of well I was artist in residence at two festivals mm. and then I had a, um, a couple of exhibitions which would pay exhibition fees it's not like lots of money but it's enough to live on. Yeah. Um, and I also got a grant from Creative Scotland, which was in Creative Scotland set up slightly differently from Arts Council in England, where they will just give artists bursaries. So which is great. yeah, without having to, to, to submit a budget about what yeah. you're going to do with the money. Yeah. Um, so I was lucky enough to get one of those. And and I guess I am a bit of a hoarder, and maybe you need to be a hoarder through the necessity that if I've earned a lot. A lot. If I've earned enough, let me stop it. I've below the national wage. If I've earned enough, <laughs> enough, <laughs> enough I'll save it. last year, then what that's allowed me to do is for the first few months of this year yeah. to take a breather, yeah, yeah. which I needed. But I was going to talk about working tax credits. But if you're self employed um, and you, you work full time but you still have a low income, which let's just face it, is most artists working in, in our sort of field, that HMRC, Her Majesty, mm. will subsidise your income and, and pay, depending on what your income is, um, pay you a certain amount each month. So it's like, it's like the dole for the, for the, for the offspring of the creative decade but without really. being relentlessly pursued and yeah and, and you're not, lots you're not, we're not relentlessly sentiment. pursued yeah. because we're industrious yeah, yeah. and we yeah. work really really hard yeah. and yeah. and i think that i would also um advocate getting jobs that have as little responsibility as possible so that they don't take up important headspace and so that they don't demand more time of you than, than is required to to actually and the cash. Mm. I work, um, I do work in kind for the studio group in Glasgow called Wasps, which means that I get a subsidised studio space. Bye. So that's really great for me. Um, it's, a, it's a great way of being able to earn less, mm. but still being able to have the glamorous lifestyle mm. that I do have. Mm. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> where, where I have a studio, or the luxury of having a, a studio. 
you can do stuff like I do, where you know you can set up for nothing. You can set up your own space. So, you know, I think I think to a certain extent, you can sustain your own practice by being savvy. And I think actually one of the few, possibly one of the few things that is coming out of the sort of recession is that sort of ability to barter for things, to find alternative ways of doing stuff. I think there's, there's a rather tiresome notion often, I think, that serious art or art which has serious intentions can't also be humorous. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that you do particularly well as well, is that you, your work is deadly serious in terms of what it looks at, what it kind of attacks, what it investigates. You know, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't get much bigger than ideas of economics and inequality and all the associated issues around that. Um, but it does that in a way which is invitational as opposed to preachy. And I think that's possibly why I use humour, because it's a way that I can... Um, seduce people with my practice. You want to engage people with the issues and you're not going to engage them by picturing them and lecturing them. You know, I have to make work which, which, which I feel is successful, but I also have to make work that I enjoy. Yeah. And I don't think, I think when I was younger, I think I had this kind of abstract idea of like what proper art was. And, um, and for a while I got very involved in this very dry work which was about performative drawing. It was very much contained within, a, I guess, a kind of a very art, art critical, art historical yeah. context. And, um, and in the end I kind of felt that was a straitjacket because it, it didn't fit with me and my personality. And, and, and you were a really fun person as well, like, not wanting to say it's really cheesy, but like... And we like, have sense of humour. <laughs> yeah. And I think that has to be present in the work. And, like, and once I've married those two things together by doing things like pooper in and, yeah. and kind of satirical, odd, hilarious things, running which pleased me, and running a gallery out of, out of my garage, that's when I kind of felt like I was, I was, I was happiest yeah. as a practitioner because I wasn't sort of subscribing to this level of what a proper artist is. But artists are entertainers and provocateurs mm. like and we're not mainstream entertainers like mm. our role is more to make people think about mm. their own everyday lives mm. in slightly different ways mm. there's a kind of with conceptual art of the 70s there was a very sort of dry conceptualism which was almost a pseudo documentary which was like which was like you know listing things Okay, mm -hmm. you know, or, or you know, um, or taking black and white photographs of things, and it kind of crossed that line between documentary and, and art practice. And so, I'm kind of satirising on Kawara and his day paintings. So, what I do is I keep um, a sort of libidinal mapping of my orgasms, and what I do is I, I, I orgasm on universal litmus paper, which turns the semen green. Every time you have to have a piece of litmus paper. No, not every time. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> not rigorous in that one. <laughs> um, and I put down the time of the day. And so I, I kind of, and I've, I've got, um, <laughs> I don't know if this is a thing to be shameful about or proud of. I've paper. got like about 200 of them. Like. Is it like the small litmus paper size? No, it's about oh, that, okay. it's about it's that wide. One. Oh, okay, right. It's okay. a square, it's about that wide, excuse me. And um, so I do, I do sell those, not many, many, but I do sell them. And I think this, but I think that, but again, there's a kind of a, the sort of satirising of that kind of conceptual yeah. art, yeah, I turn yeah. it into a sort of a wank fest. Um, <laughs> but it's still talking about what it's like to... It's still that sort of mapping, it's still, yeah. it's still got those kind of ontological concerns yeah. attached to it. I think um, that's, that's, the, that's the kind of um, most interesting, I guess, commercial work, is the one that acknowledges the fact that it is a commercial work. Yeah. And yeah. that can also be critical of that yeah. context of selling work. Um, <laughs> I sell stuff online, like yeah. books yeah. mainly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I don't sell, yeah, not so much artworks, but I guess <laughs> ephemera and stuff that surrounds the practice. Yeah. So. One of the plus sides of being maybe in performance practice is that it, it can, it can. I feel it can adjust a lot quicker and engage. You know, the legacy of the 50s, 50s, 60s and 70s was that politicisation 
it was it was the fact that performance could go into situations. It didn't always have to have a gallery. It could go actually into those situations and make work where those tensions existed. Yeah. And I think that can happen again. And I also think that we can still make work partly because, you know, to a certain extent, we are our own medium. <laughs> you know, I could turn up with a few things in the bag, probably, yeah. and, and make a piece of work. Yeah. I don't need all this sort of paraphernalia that comes with it. Um, so it means I could be really mobile, you know. Yeah. That's why we can make work here in a garage. I don't, I don't, I don't have to have galleries. I don't even have to have an official art space of any kind. And, I, yeah. and, I, and, and it's that kind of mobile nature of the work, which I think is really, which, which kind of makes it exciting for me.